Hello, everybody. This is Dragos Ternoveno from uh, 45 North. Um, today we'll have an interview with Mr. Martin Gyungeshi. Uh, Mr. Gyungeshi is a uh, member of the European Parliament and uh, a member of the Jobbik Party from Hungary. Uh, he has a lot of expertise um, in uh, Hungarian and European politics and a lot of knowledge in uh, foreign policy. And we'll discuss today about the, the political situation in Hungary, um, as well as how the Fidesz government coped with the coronavirus pandemic. And we will also take advantage of Mr. Gyungeshi's uh, foreign policy expertise to talk a, a little bit about European geopolitics in the context of the pandemic. So Mr. Gyungeshi, welcome uh, to the interview. I'm honored to have you here. Um, I will uh, delve right into the topic. Um, I don't think there has been one week in the last uh, year that I haven't read uh, some uh, worrying news uh, from Hungary in terms of the actions that the Fidesz government uh, has taken uh, with regards to uh, press freedom, academic independence, um, NGOs, uh, and so on. Uh, so there are a lot of uh, worrying news coming from Hungary. Uh, sometimes it's, it's hard to pick one specific topic to talk about. Uh, in your opinion, as a, firstly, as a Hungarian citizen, what do you think is the biggest threat that um, Viktor Orban's and Fidesz actions um, are posing to the Hungarian people right now? First of all, thank you very much for the invitation, and I'm very glad to uh, have this conversation uh, with you and uh, thank you very much for uh, for uh, uh, asking this question because I think uh, most Hungarians are very much concerned and in your question you were saying what do I say as a Hungarian citizen not as a politician and uh, not as an opposition politician but as a Hungarian citizen I'm extremely concerned uh, looking at the at the past couple of years of, of, of politics of, of, of the governing party in Hungary, that uh, the aim and the objective is to lead Hungary out of the European Union. I know that this uh, sounds uh, uh, like a bit of an exaggeration, um, but uh, if you have a look uh, at the tendency um, this, has, this has started at about 2015, 2016, at the height of the migration crisis, when um, Fidesz has uh, adopted a rhetoric and, uh, and the policy of um, continuously attacking uh, our Western European allies, the European Union, uh, NATO even, um, and at the same time, cuddling up with, uh, with Russia and China. And uh, which is, I, I mean, it's understandable if somebody is, uh, is uh, seeking uh, good economic or cultural ties with, with the big powers of the world and, uh, and uh, seeks opportunities which are mutually beneficial with uh, Russia or China. A lot of countries are doing that. But what we can see in Hungary is that for the past five or six years, there is a, a very clear tendency and the parallel tendency of uh, EU and NATO bashing, and at the same time, uh, drawing relations closer and closer and cooperation closer and closer with, uh, with, uh, with, with Eastern powers. And the two together, um, they, they, um, they, they basically lead the, uh, the, the, the observer to the conclusion that there is that this is a strategy of uh, leading and pulling Hungary out of the European Union, and now with the with the um, with this uh, pandemic, with the with the, the 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 expulsion of Fidesz from the from the uh, European People's Party, I think uh, Fidesz has basically. Um, made another step in this direction, which is now extremely worrying. I mean, uh, who would risk, uh, at, especially at the time of, uh, of, of a pandemic, which will have terrible economic, social, and political consequences, uh, even geopolitical consequences, who would risk uh, to basically um, uh, 
break ties with one of the most prestigious uh, uh, European political uh, families and, uh, and basically opt for no man's land uh, in politics. I think this is a very, very worrying tendency and trend, which might eventually lead in the direction of, uh, of uh, breaking with the European Union or uh, a Huxit. Um, I, I've read about uh, a possible exit of Hungary from the European Union, and some analysts say that it's uh, quite improbable due to the pragmatic fact that a lot of uh, money that comes uh, into the country is being diverted by corrupt activities by Fides or Fides aligned uh, politicians and businessmen. So they would be, in one sense, cutting their own branch if. Uh, if uh, Orban would push the Hungarian, uh, the, the Hungarian people out of the European Union, and furthermore, I've read that uh, the European, the Hungarian people is uh, are quite uh, pro-European. Okay, so maybe they are a bit more conservative than the median uh, European, but um, they are uh, decisively pro-European, pro-European Union. So well, absolutely, uh, you, you are right. You are right in all in all of those points. A lot of money is coming from the European uh, uh, Union, uh, and uh, Hungary has benefited enormously uh, from European funds. But at the same time, uh, last year, you know, a rule of law mechanism was adopted by the European Union, uh, by the European Parliament, and by the European Commission, which is a very um, strong vehicle in um, in stopping. EU funds being paid out to, uh, to countries with authoritarian tendencies. Um, and now if this happens and this uh, instrument is in effect as of 1st of January, uh, 2021. Uh, so at any time, uh, this rule of law mechanism can be, um, uh, can be brought into action against Hungary and against the, the Orban government. And that might be a point where um, Viktor Orban might say, if I'm not allowed to do as I please, and if there is no money coming from the European Union, then uh, what's the point of, of, of staying? So this is, this is one of our worries that this whole rhetoric and this whole tendency might reach a point where the, where the benefits, the advantages and the disadvantages basically equal out and the rhetoric of, of, of Fidesz can be upped. And, uh, and I think this is one of the major concerns of, uh, of, of Hungarian citizens as well, who, you're quite right, it, with an overwhelming majority, are pro-European at the moment. But the question mm -hmm. is uh, what uh, uh, Viktor Orban uh, tends to do in a situation where um, uh, the European Union closes the taps. And we are talking about a person uh, Viktor Orban, who is, um, how should I say, he has gone a very long way and in this populism, I know we have been there ourselves, when you basically set yourself on a track from which there is no turning back and very, very difficult to adjust, you see, I mean, after a while, uh, this becomes a, a self-serving purpose. And uh, what I can see um, in the rhetoric of Fides is uh, that, uh, that, that there is basically no, no uh, uh, possibility for adjustment anymore. It's just uh, now uh, Brussels uh, can, should be blamed for everything. If there is, if there is, um, if there is not enough vaccination, then we, then we, then we blame the, the, the European Union, no matter what, regardless of the circumstances. And I think this is a problem. Uh, you've mentioned, of course, um, the latest news uh, regarding the, the, the expulsion of uh, Fidesz uh, from the European People's Party, which, of course, was painted by Fidesz as a, a voluntary exit. Of course, reading the press, and uh, you obviously know more about this, uh, the EPP was probably anyway gonna, uh, going to exclude uh, Fidesz. Uh, can you expand on what are the political ramifications on the one hand for Fides and what are uh, uh, Fides and Viktor Orban's options after exiting the what is the biggest political group in Europe? Um, will they turn to existing uh, minor, uh, uh, smaller groups in the European Union? Would they try to go alone? Uh, what, what are you hearing and seeing? 
Well, um, at the moment, uh, all the Fidesz MEPs, or uh, 13 of them, are uh, independent MEPs, uh, uh, non-attached members of the European Parliament. And there is a lot of, lot of guessing as to which way they would be going. Uh, and of course, my guess is just as good as anyone else's. But um, of course, in the past couple of years, uh, we could see a couple of uh, trends and tendencies. Um, and preparations for this situation to occur. I mean, everyone could basically see that relations between Fidesz and EPP are getting very tense, or they're getting very cold. And uh, of course, in this situation, Fidesz has started to prepare its exit from EPP, and it was preparing very consciously for this situation. Uh, first, first and foremost, we know that Fidesz has uh, a very strong ally, uh, probably the, the, the last ally in Europe, that's uh, PiS, the governing party of Poland. Uh, PiS is the leading force in ECR, in the conservative and re reformist uh, group in the European Parliament. Uh, this, is, uh, this is a large political organization. Uh, PiS and Fidesz, they have um, excellent ties, although I think the pro-Russian attitudes within Fidesz are more than what peace can take uh, at the best of times. But anyway, um, there, is, uh, there is, I think, a very um, great likelihood of Fidesz uh, joining the ECR group upon the invitation of peace. Now, of course, in every political group, there is a very subtle balance between political parties, countries. Um, of course, there are, there are, uh, there's not only ideology, but there is size and, um, uh, and, 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 uh, uh, you know, the size of countries and size of delegations. So I think not everybody would be thrilled um, uh, by the entry of, of Fidesz, by the sheer fact that peace and Fidesz would be uh, almost certain to uh, to negotiate in an inner circle within the political group, and uh, most ECR members might not be too happy to see that. Uh, some of them might not like the extremist ideology of Fidesz as they might see it, or as many people see it, and which has become extremist in some um, uh, in in some uh, aspects anyway. And, uh, and others might just not like the fact that two big parties would be dominating the group. So if there is a small country with a, with a small delegation within the ECR group might not like the dominance of Fidesz and of PIS. So it might cause uh, some upheavals within the group. Um, some say that, um, uh, and of course Fraterni d'Italia is also in ECR, which is another big fan of, uh, of Fidesz and Viktor Orban. The other one is uh, ID, uh, identity and uh, democracy, and uh, another right-wing, uh, extreme right-wing group within the, uh, within the European Parliament. There, one of the greatest fans of Fidesz is uh, Lega, uh, the Italian party. Uh, just today, I read an interview with uh, Salvini, who has birthday today, and gave an interview to uh, some uh, some uh, uh, portal, and he was quoted saying that um, all the guesses that Lega would be joining the European People's Party are false. They are building a new alliance with um, uh, Fidesz and with Viktor Orban within the European Parliament, which basically might mean or it might suggest that there might be some kind of fusion between ECR and, and, uh, and, and the ID group. Um, which is also a possibility. Uh, who knows? I, I don't know. We just have to wait and see. Uh, do you see any political ramifications within Hungary uh, due to the, the exit of uh, Fidesz from the EPP? Absolutely. Uh, I think every, every such uh, move has ramifications. And I think uh, since we started this interview by, by the question, what do I say as a Hungarian citizen? As a Hungarian citizen, one of the biggest um, disasters that I see in this move of Fidesz is that um, the governing party of Hungary, which was 
a member up until now of one of the largest and, uh, and most prestigious uh, European political families is now outside of it. Uh, now, I think being member of EPP uh, brings a lot of benefits. Um, uh, it's you are sitting at the table of the ruling parties of, 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 of Europe, uh, governing parties of, of, uh, of, of most European countries, uh, which is a great opportunity to, to further national interests. Now, of course, we know that in the past couple of years, Fidesz has been extremely isolated within the EPP group, but nonetheless, there was always, I mean, it, it means that you are in, in the club, you are within the, you are within the, you are sitting at the same table as, uh, as, uh, uh, as, as, as uh, the leaders of, of, of most European countries. And that is, that is usually good news for, 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 for a country to further national interests, which is now lost. Um, so for, 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 for a Hungarian citizen, I think this is a terrible news in a disastrous time. Um, what it brings for Fidesz, uh, well, I just hope that now they are isolated at the European stage, now they had to leave the European People's Party. I can only hope that after their ousting from the EPP, they will be ousted from government uh, next year in the Hungarian elections, um, where, uh, of course, in Hungary, there are very interesting developments happening. So now, for the first time in the past uh, 11, 12 years, there's a great chance of, of uh, Fidesz being kicked out of government. Uh, I, I will come back to the very interesting uh, subject of uh, what's happening in Hungary because Hungary is going through a very interesting uh, political experiment, namely the primaries within the, the opposition coalition. But I just want to make a rather personal remark uh, regarding the threat as I perceive it from uh, a neighbor of Hungary. And what uh, scared me uh, reading the press, obviously, was um, the growing influence, I think it's much more than influence, it's direct control almost of uh, the, the press, because uh, uh, the, the foundations and the way that the press and the media in general is financed in Hungary gives a lot of control basically to the politicians and Fides. Uh, of course, you know what happened to Club Radio and uh, many, many other, especially online outlets that are very dependent on, uh, on uh, financing and are very, uh, how should I say, uh, vulnerable to financial uh, um, uh, problems. Uh, it's, it's scary, especially as a journalist and uh, as a person who reads a lot and obviously appreciates the media and the role of the media in society, it's kind of scary to see the level of control that uh, Fidesz has gained. And uh, my, my question is, how, how this time as, as a politician, as an opposition politician, how do you plan to counter this? Is there, is there a way to counter this besides winning the elections and restoring uh, some normality to the country? I think you have touched upon a very uh, important point, uh, and this is the this is the issue of the media. There, there are many worrying. Uh, um, uh, there, there are many many worrying signs of uh, of authoritarianism uh, in Hungary, uh, and indeed uh, the media is 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 one extremely sensitive point because uh, once you once you uh, block. Uh, the media and once uh, freedom of speech is in danger in a country, uh, from then on, uh, pluralism, um, as far as expression of opinion is concerned, is in danger. And in Hungary, of course, uh, in the past 10 years, I think the outside world and Hungarians indeed have been watching uh, these, these measures, which have been basically creeping on us step by step. Uh, and I think probably the the, the original sin was the, the, the changing of the constitution. You know, I mean, Orban, uh, Viktor Orban enjoys a two thirds majority in the Hungarian parliament, which he has obtained legitimately in 2010. But once the, the constitution has been changed um, by changing the, the, the media law, changing the, the electoral law, 
uh, from then on, I think we can we can speak of of, of some kind of a hybrid system uh, by which uh, Hungary has become something like a quasi uh, authoritarian regime in which you can see all the in, on the facade everything is all right. I mean, in Hungary we have a we, we have a court we have courts um, we have uh, medias we have a public media. Uh, we have uh, NGOs, uh, people are, are, you know, traveling in and out of the country, there's a freedom of movement, so everything on the surface and on the face of it is fine. Uh, it's only if you look at the, at the substance of all these regulations that you start to realize that there is a very significant, there's a very, very serious problem. And I think uh, the problem is the concentration of the power, the concentration of the of the financial means, um, and of course uh, control over the the authorities, which should be acting independently in every democracy. And now, if you of course, if you have a if you have a a, a state audit uh, authority, which basically penalizes every opposition party. Uh, for some stupid reason, then of course you don't have real political competition. If you have a media regulatory authority in which uh, only Fides is allowed to delegate in members, then all of a sudden they are going to make decisions whereby, um, whereby uh, uh, if, if uh, a radio uh, uh, channel expires or the concession for a, for a radio wave expires, then all of a sudden um, um, it, it, it is not going to be renewed and some friends are going to receive that opportunity. This is what happened with, with uh, Club Radio recently. Uh, you know, I mean, it was legitimately expired. Uh, they were bidding for it. They had the best bid, uh, but they said, uh, sorry, you are not getting it. Uh, we will wait for some guy to set up a radio station and we will dish it out to them. And all this, all this, um, wouldn't be any problem at all if there would be a public uh, broadcasting an, uh, 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 outlet or a public broadcasting um, a TV channel in Hungary, which functions, uh, which would function as it as it as it should. Um, there is none in Hungary. Uh, the public broadcasting in Hungary uh, is basically the flagship. Uh, propaganda channel in Hungary, where you haven't seen a single opposition um, politician enter the gates in the past five years, uh, which is which is completely outrageous. Uh, because of course, in every country you have imbalances. I think mm -hmm. uh, that's that's okay. Uh, but if the public broadcasting, which is financed from every single taxpayer's money, um, leans one way or the other, or is a flagship uh, a propaganda channel of the regime, then you have a problem. And this is what we have in Hungary. So to answer your question, what are the means? Um, well, uh, internet is still, I think, one of the big weapons that we have in our, uh, under our control and, uh, and, and, and publicity. Uh, you know, I mean, I think, uh, what what we what we still have as an opportunity is to go out to the countryside and have a direct uh, campaign go from door to door i think uh, if you look at countries like uh, america i think uh, or or other european countries where this this has been exercised very successfully we can take examples of them bring back politics uh, uh, to the people uh, you know go go and lead a door to door campaign and uh, be strong on Facebook, Twitter, uh, Instagram, whatever, bring politics uh, to the people directly um, and, and not via the media, if there is an opportunity and if it is possible. I'm, I'm glad you brought up uh, social media and the power of the internet, because obviously in the 21st century, the, the internet is the new uh, agora, the new arena where we talk and uh, discuss everything, including politics. and. Uh, uh, you are an avid uh, watcher and a connoisseur of foreign policy, obviously watched what happened in America during the election process and what happened to Donald Trump's Twitter account. And maybe this is a sing signal that um, uh, 
uh, tech companies are uh, trying to be more responsible in terms of what information is being disseminated on their platforms. Uh, do you see the European Union uh, having uh, a, sig a significant contribution to this? Do you see uh, a regulatory environment that could uh, favor transparency and maybe uh, be a real opponent, uh, in fact, to Viktor Orban's strategy of disinformation and basically flooding uh, the media with, with uh, false narratives that ultimately changes opinion and votes? Uh, absolutely. I, I think this is a new phenomenon and there is, there, is, there is enormous debate about this in the European Union and elsewhere, of course, uh, uh, the responsibility of, uh, of, of uh, uh, you know, internet platforms, uh, Facebook, Twitter, whatever it might be. And of course, there is freedom of speech on, 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 on one side. Uh, and of course, there, there are the limits uh, of freedom of speech, if there are any. Where are they, you know, and, and whose responsibility is it to step in and to control it? I think this is a legitimate debate uh, uh, and I, I, it's a very, very tough one. I, I, uh, I wouldn't dare to, to draw a straight line, uh, you know, in, in, in this question and, and, and draw up the boundaries of, of, of free speech. Um, I tend to say that, um, uh, you know, one of, the, one of the great advantages of democracy is that uh, is that everybody is allowed to express his or her opinion. And if it is an outrageous opinion, even then it should be allowed to, to, to be expressed and you have to, you have to defeat it in debate. Uh, and I think Facebook and Twitter are, are great, great platforms for this. Uh, nonetheless, there is a border where uh, certain opinions can incite uh, hatred and um, and uh, uh, you know destruction, and I think this is this is where I think Trump uh, overstepped a red line uh, because the consequences of his uh, tweets have basically led to uh, the loss of, of human lives and, and and the storming of Capitol Hill, which is which which is a disaster. Uh, now, uh, I I think. Uh, the European Union is debating this subject uh, uh, more and more frequently. There is a digital act on the way, which I think uh, is taking on the responsibility of trying to regulate uh, this field to some extent. Uh, but my, my, my question is, uh, would that uh, actually uh, help us in uh, in, um, in, in, in regulating or, or in, in, in somehow containing uh, the spread of fake news. I, I, I'm not sure about that. Um, I think the, the only thing that would help the European Union, and I think that the European Union is urgently in need of a, of a, of a platform uh, which creates for the European Union a single narrative, the European narrative. Um, and when, when, when I was campaigning in 2019 uh, as a Yobbi candidate, in our program, we have basically put forward uh, the European uh, public broadcasting, the, 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 the necessity for European public broadcasting, which would have two great benefits. Uh, one of them being that it would draw up uh, a European narrative. Uh, it is not... Uh, uh, you know, it's, it's, we, we don't have to look towards the CNN or BBC or, or Rai Uno or ZDF to, mm -hmm. to, to look for a narrative, uh, but it would have uh, one single narrative which would build up the, the European narrative. Um, it would define Europe and it would, I think, contribute greatly to European identity as such, and uh, I think which is as such still lacking. And mm -hmm. it would also be a very important and strong instrument to fight against fake news coming from either direction. Um, I think it would be worth contemplating. There have been some MEPs who have been talking about this uh, uh, previously. I think this should be picked up on and, and it should be, um, and it should be uh, 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 constructive. And this should be a competitor uh, to something like uh, uh, Google or, or, or some of the other uh, great platforms in this regard. 
Um, let's go back to the exciting news in Hungary regarding the primaries. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but for um, our viewers who do not know, uh, currently in Hungary, there's a primary process with, which basically means that there will be a selection of uh, one candidate for prime minister and for uh, each of the, the electoral um, constituencies, constituencies yeah. uh, 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 a unique uh, person to run against Fidesz from the six, I, I believe, uh, parties that form the coalition, the opposition coalition. Uh, which is something new, at least countrywide in Hungary. And uh, give me your thoughts about this. It's uh, quite a diverse political project. Uh, obviously, there are some, uh, some uh, big challenges, challenges ahead. Um, there's still a lot of time until 2022. Uh, how, are you, how are your feelings about this? Do you see this project? I think, I think the biggest challenge is to keep everybody united because it's quite uh, politically diverse uh, crew gathering. So uh, what are your thoughts on this? Uh, absolutely, uh, quite, your assessment is quite uh, correct. Uh, this is a very diverse uh, uh, opposition in Hungary. And uh, if, you, if you remember, Viktor Orban has been benefiting from this uh, greatly. He even had a political strategy um, which was uh, focused on dominating the middle ground and enjoying that there are certain parties to the right, certain parties to the left. They are, of course, uh, split among themselves. He's ruling the middle ground and, um, and uh, he, can, he can prevail. Um, now, the fact that Viktor Orban has basically moved out to the extreme right uh, in the past uh, five or six years, uh, and uh, Jobbik has basically moved to the center, to the center right, um, uh, and, and, and other political formations have uh, popped up, you know, momentum is a new phenomenon, it's, uh, it's a liberal uh, party, a young uh, uh, party which has been formed a couple of years ago, there is LMP which is uh, running on a, on a green ticket, um, and we have uh, some left, uh, left liberal parties, the Socialist Party and the Democratic Coalition, and of course, Párbeszéd, uh, which uh, which um, it's a, it's a small party, but it has uh, given the mayor of uh, of, of Budapest, uh, Gergely Karácsony, who is very charismatic and uh, who is uh, leading the polls in 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 the prime minister among the prime minister candidates uh, amongst the opposition parties. So it is a it is a very heterogeneous crowd. You are right in pointing that out. Nonetheless. Um, we are living under extraordinary circumstances in Hungary. We have an authoritarian regime, which has basically uh, moved, uh, it's, it's beyond the pale uh, by now. You know, it has, uh, it has I think, uh, exceeded the point of no return. And uh, there are no, there, are, there is basically, we are left with nothing else but to save, uh, 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 save all those principles uh, for which Hungary has basically changed um, the, the, the communist regime in Hungary 30 years ago. So um, basically uh, now uh, the democratic principles are put into question in Hungary by Viktor Orban and our Euro-Atlantic orientation is being put into, in, into question uh, uh, by, by Fidesz. So this is, uh, these are already two very good reasons for all the opposition parties to put aside their, their uh, the, the, the details, you know, I mean, of course, we all come from ideological, uh, various ideological backgrounds. Uh, we might not agree on, on, uh, on every issue. Uh, we are different political parties. We do uh, have different political programs, but uh, we agree in two uh, very, very important things, uh, rule of law and democracy and the fact that Hungary uh, for the last 1,100 years has been uh, a, a member of uh, the, the European uh, family and we should uh, keep it that way. Uh, and uh, I think uh, for, 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 the, for, 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 uh, for this aim and for this purpose, uh, we are in the process now. We have a basically every day, uh, uh, 
meeting of these political parties, we have working groups, which are basically putting together and amalgamating the programs of all these different political parties. We are having a look at uh, what, what there is in common uh, between us and what are those issues which, which are subject to debate. We are putting those aside and we are saying, okay, uh, that's, that's, that's not that important. Let's build a program around what we agree on. And surprise, surprise, uh, on most of the issues, we can actually either agree on or we can uh, find a, a compromise deal. It's a, I think it's a very healthy exercise, something which in Hungarian politics has never happened before. And I personally find it extremely exciting and, 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 um, and, and a great innovation. Uh, we should have started this uh, way before, um, you know, and, and, and I think if you are looking around in the world, if you are looking, just to give you one example at the success of Sweden, I think uh, the success of Sweden was uh, that all the different political parties and ideologies have basically managed to sit down together and uh, basically define what is uh, the, what is the, 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 the common national ground and, uh, and, and build a, a, a political middle uh, center um, around it. And this is, that is what is what is characteristic of Swedish politics uh, till today with a huge um, uh, economic and political success drawing from it. So I think this is what, what Hungary should be doing now. This is the experiment that we are uh, that we are constructing now in Hungary. It's a pity we are doing it now and uh, we didn't do it 30 years ago, but I think it is very, uh, it is very encouraging and it is, it, is, it, is, it is actually a very positive experiment. Uh, and I think everybody who enjoys and loves democracy will, uh, will um, support your initiative. Um, obviously, uh, this experiment um, happens on the tragic backdrop of the pandemic. And uh, I was uh, genuinely shocked. I, I saw um, a link that I've sent you prior to this interview um, with a table of countries and um, uh, regarding the pandemic numbers, total cases, uh, deaths, hospitalizations, and so on. And uh, if you sort by the number of deaths per 1 million people, uh, Hungary is basically in the top 10. And if you exclude some very small countries like San Marino uh, and Andorra, I think, whatever. It's, San Marino, yes, and Andorra, yeah. I think yeah, yeah it's example. something like seventh place in the world. So uh, the, there is a lot of human tragedy happening in Hungary as well as in the region. But it seems like in Hungary, um, something went even more wrong that than uh, than in the neighboring countries, and uh, I would be interested to see if you can tell me what exactly did the government did wrong. E every government, especially in Eastern Europe, had the same challenge, the same problems as a backdrop: societal problems, economic problems, corruption, and so on. But somehow, uh, Hungary was very badly hit, as well as well as the Czech Republic. To be to be fair. So uh, what happened in Hungary regarding the pandemic? Uh, we have experienced a, 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 very, um, a, a, a very strange uh, phenomenon in Hungary. Uh, we basically, as opposed to other countries in Europe, uh, we have basically uh, skipped the first wave. Um, up until September in Hungary, there were basically no cases at all, uh, or at least we didn't uh, identify any cases in Hungary. Um, and um, as, a, as a result of that, I think the whole, the government and the, the, the experts have become completely complacent uh, with this situation. And Hungary has not uh, been prudent enough, sorry, uh, not Hungary, the Hungarian government was not prudent enough to, uh, to, 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 to look at the first wave as a time of grace for Hungary um, and learn from the, uh, from the mistakes of other countries, 
who have maybe reacted late, who have uh, who have tried to navigate in a, in a, a amidst a storm. Uh, we 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 had the time to basically um, build up the infrastructure and the and the necessary tools to 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 get ready for the for the time when the when when the catastrophe hits because everybody could see that in the middle of the euro in, in the middle of europe the virus is not going to walk around uh, a, a country which is basically right at the center of of of, of the european continent it is just uh, uh, some we were just maybe lucky or or there, there was some uh, I, I don't know the reason for it, but this time should have been spent with preparations. Uh, Hungary, Hungary was complacent, and the, the Hungarian government was arrogant, and it didn't get uh, it, it didn't get prepared. We should have gotten our schools prepared for online teaching, our universities prepared for online teaching, our hospitals ready uh, for uh, for for this situation to kick in. Um, and, and we just didn't do it. And we were surprised when in September, the second wave hit in uh, with, uh, with full force. And even when the second force hit in, and I think this is, this is, this is a, a sin of the Hungarian government, um, the, even at the time of the, of, the, of the pandemic raging in Hungary, we were busy, the Hungarian government was busy uh, picking fights with the European Union on rule of law, on uh, on it was it was uh, blaming the European Union for for not being able to coordinate perfectly the uh, acquisition of the vaccines and negotiating on the on the global market for the vaccines in getting ready the recovery fund the seven hundred and fifty billion uh, 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 euro fund. Uh, which is there to save European businesses and which is basically a miracle that the European Union has managed to get it on the table and to push it through. The seven-year budget um, was basically blocked by the Hungarian government with silly excuses. So, uh, so I think uh, we are paying the price of a completely irresponsible government, which instead of getting prepared for the pandemic during the first wave and dealing with the pandemic during the second wave uh, was, was basically uh, trying to deter uh, attention uh, from this uh, catastrophe and uh, blame, blame Brussels and pick fights uh, Brussels, which basically just had a problem with Viktor Orban stealing European taxpayers' money and uh, uh, disrespecting or disregarding uh, uh, rule of law um, rules in the European Union. So I think uh, we are basically paying the price uh, for that and the Hungarian nation is suffering because of an irresponsible government. Uh, um, I'm gonna connect the two topics, the, the, the primary process and the 2022 elections and the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, one of the main arguments of one government during the years was its economic success. And uh, if you read through political analysis in Hungary, uh, a lot of analysts say that um, the economic impact of the pandemic will badly hit Fidesz's main argument, probably on the backdrop of the 2022 elections. Um, do you think that is true? And if so, what are the coalitions uh, main ideas and strategies to bring back Hungary to a better economic place after the pandemic, in the aftermath of the pandemic? Now, uh, yes, I, I think if there is something, if, if there is something uh, positive in, uh, in, in Fidesz's um, past 10 or 11 years uh, was basically fiscal discipline. Um, which I mean, if you regard that as a as an economic success, I think that's that's one of them. Um, if you look at the budget deficits, the 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 state debt of Hungary, uh, Viktor Orban has managed to reduce it to some degree. Uh, budget deficits were kept low, below the three percent threshold. Inflation was low. Uh, now, of course, all these in a booming environment. So I mean, this is not all. 
just the benefit of or just not not just uh, all to the to the uh, to the greatness of Viktor Orban and and economic policymakers in Hungary. This was in a booming European and global economic environment. Nonetheless, we have seen many many governments across Europe who can't keep a, a tight budget uh, even at the time of a boom. But that's uh, that, that's just a footnote. Um, now. What we can see now, of course, um, the, every government is quite right to, to do a counter cyclical um, uh, economic policy. Uh, and when there is a downturn, money is spent and poured into the economy. And in these times, fiscal deficits and, and state debt is basically on the increase. Um, this is what is happening now in Hungary. So basically, our this um, this uh, uh, prudent or, or, or conservative um, uh, budgetary fiscal policy is gone now. Uh, but I think uh, what is what is uh, uh, worrying is the is the enormous um, uh, the, the sheer size of corruption in Hungary, and uh, which which is basically kicking back in the economy as well. Um, we have had fiscal discipline. Uh, state debt was basically being reduced. European funds were pouring into the country, maybe due to the Fidesz's good relationship with uh, the German ruling party and with Angela Merkel, German investment was pouring into the country in the past uh, uh, decades, including the, pa the, the, the past uh, uh, 10 years, which was of course benefiting uh, the, the, the Hungarian economy. Uh, and the Orban government. Now, with the break from the European uh, uh, People's Party, I think good relations with, with, with Germany are over. Um, and in the past 10 years, what we could see that all these funds were basically channeled into uh, cronies' pockets. Uh, people uh, who are close to, to Viktor Orban uh, to uh, the members of the Fidesz party. I mean, corruption is something which you, you, you just cannot comprehend, even in Romania, I think uh, uh, you would be astonished uh, at the, not at the sheer size. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and what I'm saying is not at the levels of uh, corruption, um, because I know that you're, you're good in that as well, but at the concentration and uh, the mechanisms which have been built out to channel uh, funds, um, taxpayers' money and European funds into cronies' pockets. I mean, this is something you, you just wouldn't be able to comprehend uh, even in Romania, uh, because that is, that is, I think, one of the main features and main characteristics of, of Orban's uh, hybrid uh, regimes. And I think, um, you, you were asking what can we do to, uh, what, what could the, after 2022, uh, a, a new government uh, give to the nation and, and how could they put the, 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 the country's economy on the rise again? Mm -hmm, I mm -hmm. think uh, in one word, um, uh, eradicating corruption uh, and, and getting rid of these corruption channels uh, that, that Fidesz has been busy building out uh, during the past couple of years. Just to give you one example, Dragos. Uh, today, this is a fresh news uh, of, from, uh, from, from the morning. Uh, today, uh, it hit the headlines in, in of course, opposition uh, 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 portals uh, and websites that uh, 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 now there are about 50 uh, companies in Hungary who through public procurement have received from the government the opportunity to, uh, to these are businesses which liquidate companies. Uh, mm -hmm. Companies who are now in financial trouble, they are going bust. There are hundreds of hundreds and thousands of companies going bust in Hungary at the moment. And Fidesz is basically channeling out through public procurement money to companies, 80% of which have been founded a couple of weeks ago by 
by people who are close to Fidesz or who are uh, related to certain Fidesz politicians who are specializing in liquidating companies. Now, I think this is, this is something which uh, in any other country would be called high treason. Uh, and you would, uh, you, would, you would basically, all such governments would, would, would go down in an instant who would, who would do something like that. Uh, because this is actually, this is grotesque, uh, mm -hmm. which is happening in Hungary. This is fresh news from Hungary today. Something like 30 companies out of 50 who have won through public procurement are close uh, to, uh, to, uh, to, to Fidesz or directly linked uh, to Fidesz. This corruption is completely unacceptable. And what I can promise uh, in the name of, I think all the political parties uh, who are in this opposition coalition that if they win uh, the elections after 2022, uh, we will free and rid uh, the Hungarian population from this uh, corruption, which just seems to be everywhere in Hungary. And uh, I, I definitely hope you do because um, uh, corruption is basically just like the virus. If uh, it's not uh, cleaned out everywhere, uh, nobody is safe. So, especially within the European Union. So, um, I hope uh, that we, at least at the government, uh, at the government level, because we, but at least at um, NGO and a civic society level, we can discuss and exchange best practices to do just that. Oh, absolutely. For yeah, absolutely. Of, and, and, of everyone. And, absolutely. And just, just one, uh, one uh, final note on that, because I know it has a, a Hungarian-Romanian uh, uh, connection as well. Uh, we, uh, we will be, uh, and what, what we are united uh, on, all of us opposition parties is that Hungary must join on the first day the, the European public pro, uh, prosecution. prosecution. Uh, because at the moment in Hungary, uh, one of the biggest problems that we have is that the public prosecutor is also, Peter Polt, is, uh, uh, is an, is an ex-Fides uh, member, a close friend of Viktor Orban, and he is just incapable of uh, starting investigations and making the necessary uh, legal proceedings to clean up corruption. Uh, he is basically the main player in concealing corruption in this country, a close friend of Viktor Orban. And of course, the courts cannot do anything. Everybody's asking, why don't the courts rule? Well, if a public prosecutor doesn't start an investigation or doesn't file a legal claim, uh, then the court uh, cannot make a ruling, cannot decide on anything. So exactly. uh, basically, the, the changing the public, the, the Hungarian uh, chief prosecutor on day one of the new government and uh, putting Peter Polt into jail, that would be a, 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 an instant measure. And on, day, and on the same day, join the, the European public uh, uh, prosecution, which in every case, can start uh, 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 a proceeding, a legal uh, procedure in a case where European funds are, are, are concerned. Um, our final topic of the day, our favorite subject, uh, foreign policy. Um, a lot of, uh, has happened in the last um, three, six months. Um, of course, the American uh, presidential election uh, Merkel will uh, be leaving the, um, her position as chancellor, uh, which might have a big impact on European politics and obviously the geopolitics uh, of the pandemic itself. Uh, I was genuinely surprised and maybe a little bit shocked about uh, Mr. Siarto's uh, comments prior to the election. Uh, he was basically criticizing uh, Joe Biden uh, in very, very stark terms, uh, basically throwing out the window any diplomatic uh, protocol, regardless of what you think about that person, you should have known better as a, as a top diplomat of uh, Hungary. And um, my question is, how do you view uh, US-Hungarian relations uh, after the Biden win? This would be one topic, and uh, the other would be, how do you see the pandemic itself changing the European geopolitical landscape within, let's say, the next five to 10 years? Um, 
well, Hungarian US relations. Um, yes, I, I, I think uh, it was uh, it was highly unwise uh, from the Hungarian government uh, prior to the US elections to to place its bets. Uh, I know that uh, everyone has preferences, but I think um, a small country's government is is placed best at uh, trying to uh, trying to build good relations with uh, with every democratically elected government, um, especially if that government is 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 heading a, a superpower, uh, which is our 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 uh, number one ally, uh, economically, commercially, culturally, politically, and in every sense, uh, and security wise, of course. So uh, I, I think this was highly unwise, and it already shows that one of the biggest problems with with this. Uh, regime that we have in Hungary is that um, is that um, it, it basically builds its politics on on uh, on confrontation, and uh, I think especially in diplomacy, uh, this is extremely dangerous because the politics is is uh, is 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 uh, basically permanent change, and uh, if you cannot adapt uh, to situations and you cannot uh, uh, you cannot build. Uh, connections with uh, with countries and with with governments uh, at the time of elections, then you are just uh, not doing what you are supposed to as a politician. I mean, if you are incapable of that, then you are in the wrong profession. You are in the wrong job. And especially if you are the chief diplomat of Hungary um, and you behave like that, then uh, you you not only um, then you not only uh, uh, disqualify yourself, but you bring shame to your country. And I think this is exactly what Peter Siarto is doing at an increasing uh, scale. Um, so US-Hungarian relations are going to be terrible in the, in the next year. Uh, you, can, uh, you can prepare yourself for the wildest uh, uh, exchange, uh, I think, that you have ever seen in uh, in, in, in the US-Hungarian relations. Um, this will also uh, depend on who the US will, will who the, the State Department will nominate as a US ambassador. Mm -hmm. But one thing is for sure, um, he or she is, is, is not going to be soft on this regime. Uh, that is what I can see from, uh, from all the communiques of, uh, of, of the Biden administration. You know, Anthony Blinken is, uh, has Hungarian connections and has Hungarian roots. So I think for him, this is uh, 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 for, the, uh, uh, for the, the Secretary of State, this is uh, almost a personal. personal issue. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. And, and I, think, um, uh, I think knowing the, the current uh, democratic administration's stance on rule of law and democracy, and uh, its objective to engage itself on the international stage and once again be a, um, uh, a leader of democratic nations in the world, um, it is going to give Viktor Orban a hard time. Uh, and I hope they will uh, for the benefit of the Hungarian nation. And uh, I hope uh, that uh, in, after 2022, we can, we can open a new chapter and forget about the the, the past. Um, your 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 other question, uh, apart from Hungarian uh, U.S. relations, um, yes, uh, the the European Union. Uh, we 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 could see a lot of changes. Um, although with the election of Armin Laschet to 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 head the CDU CSU. Um, there is a, a new person arriving to the to the top of the party, perhaps uh, a new chancellor. CDU uh, CSU looks or is is the favorite to win the elections in the in the in the autumn. Uh, people are saying, or what I think is probably the most likely, that they might build a coalition with the Greens, who have who have uh, come closer to CDU CSU, I think that there is what you can see is that uh, that uh, like in Baden-Württemberg, uh, a coalition could be built between the two parties. It might be possible to build it on a federal level. I think the distance between the two parties has basically disappeared on 
on a number of issues. And if such a coalition is going to happen, then uh, the Greens are definitely going to uh, put pressure on CDU, CSU, vis-a-vis uh, -vis Viktor Orban. Mm -hmm. So pressure is going to build up on the Hungarian government um, from uh, a possible uh, uh, German coalition after the, the autumn elections. At least what I can see here in the European Parliament, one of the strongest critics of the, of the Orban government are the German Greens, the, the, the Green Party um, uh, in Germany. So um, having said that, um, I think uh, the, 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 the environment or the global environment, the European environment is quite favorable for, uh, for a change of regime in Hungary in the 2022 elections. Um, uh, but of course, it's, this doesn't mean that uh, the Hungarian opposition can lay back. We have to, we have to uh, go through the primaries. We have to uh, offer to the Hungarian electorate um, a, a real competition of opposition party candidates in the 106 constituencies. Uh, we hope to offer a, 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 a real democratic competition in choosing the, the, the prime minister elect uh, among the opposition parties. We already have uh, three candidates who have announced their candidacy. I think there are more to come. Uh, and I think in the, in the next one year, uh, we, can, we, can, we can celebrate uh, the triumph of democracy in these primaries, which are going to, I think, electrify the Hungarian electorate and, um, and even draw in um, undecided voters who will get a very clear choice between an authoritarian regime and the democratic um, uh, opposition, uh, which, uh, which of course uh, will go through the primaries first and then challenge the Orban government. And Hungary can uh, not only get rid of the Orban government, but open a, a new era uh, and a new chapter in Hungarian history, political history. Uh... I certainly hope you will uh, do so because um, democracy is under attack in many countries, I think in every country, uh, maybe except for, for the mythical uh, northern states of Denmark, Sweden and Norway, I think uh, democracy is under attack everywhere, including the United States, as we saw, and uh, it's important that people uh, who have certain principles and ideas uh, to stand up and um, for democracy, be it in civic society, NGOs, or the political arena. Uh, I want to thank you very much for uh, being uh, with us. Uh, you were very informative, and uh, I hope um, our Romanian and the, all our audience are more informed about uh, Hungary, and we wish you all the best in your endeavors. Thank you very much, Mr. Timberman, for this opportunity, and I, I hope to have this occasion at another time as well. Thank you. Thank you very much.